Good morning, everybody. There we go. Ciao, Letizia. Good to see you. Hello, Bren. Hello, Raffaele. Good to see you. Hello, Melody. Hello, Patsy. Good to see you. Hello, Elisa. Chalabani. Chalabani. Welcome. Hello, Anika. Sweden's in the house. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start. Good morning, everyone. Hello, Renee. So I took some of your oh, took some of your recommendations yesterday. Um, learning how to block the paper, but I also labeled everything, so it'll be easier to follow. I think I'm, I'm an atrocious speller, um, so there's some black marks on the on the paper. Hello, Sandra. Hello, Anil Swami. And hello, Linda. Okay. So there were some questions from um, uh, from some of you. I love your questions. I try to incorporate them. Um, how is the masking fluid? This was from Nancy. How how is the masking fluid in the bottle after being open for four weeks? Can you still use it? It's a great question. So I'm going to point this down bring it up a little bit there we go and I see my my screen is still slightly bluish which I don't understand um, so Renee says awesome my pocketbook is ready that's uh, beautiful so these are from yesterday and what I did to answer uh, Nancy's question this was a new bottle I opened up yesterday so it's one day um, and these are the ones I used to do these um, lines in April, so um, about a, just about a month ago. These two right here, and I put them all three down yesterday, so you can see they're all the same. Um, but let's let's do it again. And I know some of you put these upside down. Um, yeah, that 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 can work. But as long as you put the cap on, you hear it snap. It, it will close out the air. So here we go. There's line one, that's from 30 days ago. 30 days ago. And this is, this one is yesterday. Okay. So yes, uh, 30 days is a no brainer. But you wanna hear Click. You want to make sure it's sailed. Okay, so I'll leave these here and we'll try it. Uh, um, try another 30 days. I'm fine with that. So this is how it dries. This is from yesterday, and then we can we can just peel it off from the ones from yesterday. Be better if I had a kneaded eraser, um, but since I don't have that with me readily right here, I'm just gonna. And you wouldn't want to do these big puddles of stuff, but they're all gonna be the same. That's some heavy stuff. Are you not supposed? To? Hello, Mona. Um, Let's see, Nancy says, are you not supposed to shake the bottle? My instructor did, so of course I did too. Um, no, that shouldn't change it. The only reason that you really kind of wouldn't want to, to shake it, Nancy, is that you would put, um, you could put air bubbles in it. But they're gonna go away. See, like, there's an air bubble right, right there. There's an air bubble. It looks like a detention, but it's not. It's an air bubble. And I can just pop it. It's gonna. Um, well, wait, let's just do it. Let's 
So, you know, I don't think it not so much matters as long as you uh, just get rid of the air. But there's there's no air pockets there. Yeah, so I think the teaser right. If you shake it, you can you can create the bubbles. If you leave it, the bubbles will go away. But you can see there's because I didn't care when I put these out. There's a little tiny air bubble, you know, right there. Let me get rid of it. But you're going to be using the little pipettes. You're going to be using most likely you're going to use these little pipettes right here. And if you have an air bubble, it's going to it's going to affect the capillary action a little bit. But you're going to probably use those like that. So best if you if you don't need to um, is not to shake it. Hello, Gabriel. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to throw that over there. So I was asked from Eve and from Otto about the paper to do the, when I show you the drawdowns, these are done on Lana Ockerell. My chemists have standardized, that's what they do, it's what they use all the time. It's got a good sizing to it. Um, so it's, it's uh, Lana Ockerell, uh, 140 pound cold press paper. And then the paper I'm using here is Stonehenge Aqua Cold Press 140 pound cold press. Let's see if I can get that better view for you. There we go. Now that I'm back at work, I'm gonna go and take over one of the downstairs offices and turn it into a to a room, it makes it, make it easier. Um, Ring gave me some great information on how to deal with my off color from the um, video, so I'm gonna try that. Um, there was a question about pigment yellow 40. Pigment yellow 40 is a rulian. And uh, whenever I talk about pigments, I'm only talking about our pigments. Somebody else certainly is gonna have their aurelian, um, not, not all manufacturers use the same pigment manufacturers. Um, so I can only talk about ours. And um, these are from my chemist. And these are, these are from indirect light. These right here, are, they're kept in indirect light. However, these were put into the xenon feedometer because that's how we, how we test it. Um, so let me show you. Most of you, when you do artwork, you're gonna, if you put conservation glass on it, it's gonna last longer because it stops some of the UV from coming in. If you keep it in indirect light, it's gonna last longer. I don't think anybody's gonna put their, their artwork out in direct light, at least not for long. Um, so our, our, our Aurelian, is a light fastness of two, which means we've tested it in the xenon phenometer out to a, a hundred years. So this is 2020, this is 1994, that is 1994, this is the year 2000, this is 2018. And we do one from every single batch we make. I didn't take them all out, there'd be a whole table full. But there you go. And so, yeah, somebody asked me, you said, well, aren't those kept in the office? Yes, they are. Um, if they were on the office wall, um, they would be the same. If they were behind UV glass, they would be the same. When you start changing is when you're going to go and put it in direct sunlight. Um, okay. Hello, Joanne. Good to see you. Hello, Propful. Good to see you. So the next question, um, so Celine said she uses three to four colors, and that's absolutely fine. You know, I, I see the paint that we manufacture is a tool in your toolbox, and you need to always be the one to decide what you want to put in your toolbox. 
um, just as a mechanic, it, it doesn't just use all, you know, all screwdrivers. They use hammers and wrenches and spanners. Um, the mechanic makes that choice and you as an artist need to be able to make that choice. So if you can do everything that you want to with three or four colors, that's fine. And if you want to use 40 colors, that's also fine. There's, there's nothing that says how few or how many you should use. It's all about you and what tools you need to, um, to create your vision. Um, Rin said, thank, thank you to everybody for their time. And I'm, I'm just going to uh, piggyback off of Rin's comment. I thought it was really good. I'd love to see that you talk to each other and answers each other's questions. I think that's one of the wonderful um, um, contributions of art and people that practice art is the willing to share. Somebody liked the cat tongue brushes. And I have three. I only found two on my desk. This is the Princeton. Princeton and this is the silver and then somewhere around here I have the da Vinci so synthetic synthetic and the da Vinci is a natural and then Anna Marie asked how did the, the how does the new black compare so I thought I would just um, put together a good portion of them so that the darkest color we have, and we do that by using the L on the C lab, and it goes from um, it goes from one being the darkest to 100 being the brightest. So if we look at that, indigo is the darkest. The new color is the McCracken black right here, and it's a 45. So it is it is darker than these right here, but it's lighter than these right here. So in reference to indigo in Danthrone, lamp black, um, it is lighter. Neutral tint, it's about the same as neutral tint. Um, and it's darker than ivory black, lunar black, or black tourmaline. If we're looking at the scale from one to a hundred, about 50, somewhere in here, somewhere in this region right here would be gray. Gray the US way and then gray the other way. So somewhere somewhere in, in right above in this area. Okay. I wanted to show you since we've been doing it each week. This is um, this is the masking fluid after a month. So after a month. So still comes off. Somebody asked yesterday, and I thought it was a really good question. Um, the, the preferable way of using the masking fluid is to use it on dry paper. And I mean, you can always decide, it's the neat thing about being, in, being an art, being an artist is it, the creativity is just through the roof. So you can always make the decision to use it on wet paper. Um, just, just know that if you use it on wet paper, I'm using this other side here, but I have all my masking fluid on this, all right. If I wet this paper down, depending on the size and what, pipe, what type of paper you're using, the little fibers um, can come up. I wonder if I can show that to you. It's going to be really hard to show you, um, but you can have the little fibers because it's, it's made it, it's fibers, and then if you put the masking fluid on top of it, and it dries. When you pull up, you have you can have the chance of pulling those fibers off. Okay.
Lobeznik. Also, Raphael says, my primary yellow is still Aurelian. Um, Gabriel, how is lunar black and ivory black differ other than granulation? Ivory black, okay. So, um, lunar black, which is Mars black, is, so ivory black, the neat thing about ivory black, when you paint out the ivory black, you'll see that it has a yellowish, um, a yellowish tint to it. It's warm, so it has a yellowish tint to it. So ivory black has a yellowish tint, whereas lunar black does not. Um, lunar black is going to, for the granulation part anyway, move away from, from um, itself very readily. Um, so that's the big difference. So ivory black, let me get that piece of paper back. So here is ivory black, and here is lunar black. They're gonna both be in the warmest quadrant. They're gonna be in this quadrant right here. So this is the yellow, this is the red, this is the green, and this is the blue. So both are going to be in the warmest quadrant, and that's this quadrant right here. This is the warmest, this is warm, um, this is coolest, and this is cool. So they're gonna, they're gonna exist right here in this quadrant. They're gonna be way down here because that's kind of where they're at. Um, so the big difference is the, the ivory black is um, it's going to have more of a, of a yellowish. The, the thing to always, thing I certainly want to make really clear is what you can see with your eyes, with that beautiful brains that we have, and how we, how we as humans interpret color is not the same way that the machine interprets color. The machine's going to give us back numbers, and the numbers say we're in the quadrant, they go, etc. But the machine isn't going to see, for example, what we would feel as warm or what we would feel as cool. It's just putting it in that quadrant. So um, what a machine sees is not what a human sees. And Raphael's correct, there are different black pigments. Okay, um, when I, and I can show, I can pull these out and show you next week, the ivory black would certainly be because it has that, 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 that yellowish um, tint to it. Okay, so, okay. Great question, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so Lisa says, one is from outer space. That's cute. So let me show you, this is what we did yesterday. And I know many of you, um, that were here yesterday and came back today. So let's, let's just show what we looked at yesterday. And then we're gonna be doing it again. So let me uh, see if I can see that. Let's see if you can see that. There we go. So this is what we did yesterday. We're we'll doing it again today. I thought I'd show you what they look like completely dry. that we did. So we'll play with that today. And I did want to show you one other thing. Uh, of course, I'm going to start throwing papers around. There we go. So some of you had asked a question yesterday. It was a really, really good question. And I just want to make, make sure I got back to it. Um, and then we can go over it. If you like it, we can go over um, uh, next week even, even more. Okay, so um, you had asked yesterday about uh, how come a certain pigment is in, uh, a certain color is in uh, pigment red 101 or pigment red 102 for example and let me go over that 
further just so we're all on the on the same page and then next week what I'd like to do is go over it more in depth because I think some of you would find well probably most of you would find it very interesting so the pigment for example pigment red one oh one doesn't mean that it's organic or inorganic or natural or synthetic it can be any one of those so it's going to be one of these two and it's going to be one of these two it can be an organic natural it's going to be a combination okay it doesn't it but there can be a natural within this category there could be a synthetic within this category there can be an organic there could be an inorganic okay so how it works is this when we for when there's a manufacturer right here say it's and they're really huge companies there's some small companies but most of them are super huge like BASF multi-billion dollar company Dow Chemical multi-billion dollar company Archer Daniel Midlands DuPont and there's smaller ones but they're mostly these massive companies with thousands of chemists each um, and what they will do is they will send it to one of two societies one of them in Europe is the Society of Dyers and Colorists and I put the links here in case you want to go see it Society of Dyer, Dyers and Colorists the other one is the American Association of Textile Chemists and Colorists and what these two societies do, and I'll go over this more with you next week, I just kind of wanted to answer the question that you had yesterday. What these two societies do is they decide, once the manufacturer sends it in to here, these two come up with the CI name. For example, Pigment Violet 19. These guys come up with it. They have standards that they use, and they come up with this right here. Um, they also come up with the five-digit di five color index number, which each one of the, the five digits means something. And so we'll go over that next week further because I think this is some good stuff to, to, to go over. Um, and the reason the ochres and the siennas are such a mammoth, a mammoth group is because these two groups lumped so many of them into this grouping. So it's, it's not the manufacturer that decides, it's this group that decides, okay? So we can, go, we, can, we can talk about this more. I just thought your question was really, really good. And we just talked about whether it was synthetic or natural, but there's way more behind it. And this is kind of, this is kind of where it starts. The manufacturer sends it in just like I send my materials into um, ACMI for toxicology. So independent, they test it, they say what the label should be, they review it. Um, if they have questions, they go to an outside laboratory who sends them back information before they make the determination. And the same thing with um, ASTM. So, so those, are the, those are the societies I belong to and these big companies belong to these societies. All right, so I hope that makes some, some sense. We'll go over it further. I thought it was a really, really good question, and I didn't want to, um, I really wanted to answer it a little bit more further, so we'll go over more. Let's see. So Chrissy says Venetian red synthetic versus genuine. Convince me to buy Venetian red. Um, so Christy, the the Venetian. It's really a lot of things. Almost anything for the automobile industry, for example, or for um, industry in general, um, is made in the laboratory. And that's because um, it needs to be perfect. They want perfection. And the interesting thing with naturals is they're not perfect. And that's, that's kind of one of the, the beautiful qualities about a natural. And there doesn't have to be a choice. 
Um, you can use synthetics or you can use naturals. It really comes down to, it really comes down to, does it meet your needs? And are you getting what you need from it? That, that's really kind of what it, what it comes down to. I don't have, I have the um, Venetian red with me. Let me see if I can get that. the other one away so what I'll do next week is I'll bring both out and I'll, 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 I'll draw them both down yeah I think that's so I think first that's 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 kind of the way that I look at it too I love the imperfections with natural pigments I also like the standard synthetic when I need them and that's fantastic okay so let's go ahead and look at some colors so Ren, what I'll do is I will pick out a couple and we'll go over maybe kind of the birth of a pigment. So let me look at that um, um, and that way I can, I can lay it out. But I'm glad to do that, I love that. And uh, I brought a bigger um, lotus today. So Renee had said this yesterday. So what I did is I, I, I um, oh, you know what I didn't do? didn't draw this upside down. Let me see if that's going to work. Can you still see it? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. It's this way. Okay. So, um, let me make sure I pick them out in order. So this is gonna be the Terra Escalano. Oh, you know what? I just said I would put it inside this bowl. So that's a Terra Escalano, and that is a natural from Italy. It's a raw sienna. Okay, if you guys can read upside down, it makes it easier if I do it the other way. Thank you. It's actually easier for me to do it this way. one's going to be, this one's going to be raw umber violet. Raw umber violet. You see that? Yeah. So raw umber violet is a natural raw umber. It's domestic, which means U.S. Um, and it has the addition of queen violet to cool it down. So raw umber violet is a natural raw umber, domestic, with queen violet to cool it down. Okay, this is gonna be um, Venetian red.
So this is, ooh, that is just bold. So that is Venetian red. Venetian red is a synthetic iron oxide. Because Italian Venetian red, as um, was said here, is a natural. This one is a synthetic. See, I'm blotting. I can learn. Okay. Um, Pompeii red. Pompeii red is a natural from Italy. Pompeii red, natural from Italy. And this is burgundy yellow ochre. Burgundy yellow ochre is from is a France and it's natural. Burgundy yellow ochre. So the next one we have is roasted French ochre, and that is burnt French ochre from France. So we burn the French ochre to get this. We have a furnace in the laboratory. The only place we're allowed to have heat is in the laboratory. Okay. Hello, George. So George says, Venetian and Indian red are so useful for textures, buildings, and many objects. If you haven't, uh, Giovanni, George, Raffaelli, um, who are all on, have beautiful, um, you should go to their sites and see their, see their paintings. This is English red earth. It is a red ochre, it's natural, and it's from England. I don't know, son. That's a good one for um, George or Raffaele or Giovanni, who's wa watching. Could any of you answer um, Sandra's question? Would yellow ochre mixed with Aurelian make burgundy yellow ochre? Okay, this is going to be yellow ochre, which is a natural domestic.
that's yellow ochre. What I can do, Sanders, we can try that next week. I'll pull those, I'll pull those tubes. And this one's gonna be raw sienna. Raw sienna is a natural domestic. Sandy. Okay, I'm gonna just kind of push this up for a second. And then a you know, piece of paper. So I thought I would just mix some colors. I'm not going to necessarily, mm, well, I should have wrote them all down. Um, I had big plans today of, being, of labeling labeling things. So whenever we did something, I'm going to tell you what it was. But I started with this, and I will. Interesting that I saw when I did all the interviews with uh, brand ambassadors, and maybe maybe um, you did this as well. It was when they were going to use a color or the colors they used, they tested them all on pieces of paper and then kept that as information of, of how they came up to mixes and um, just the amount of, of thought that was going through it was just incredible. That's the raw umber violet. Raw umber violet. I must say, I really like the naturals. Um, I love the vibrance of the synthetics, the um, quins, the pyrroles, the perilines. Um, because they're so vibrant, they're so, um, but there's something that's so beautiful about a natural. Okay, so now let's try, let me show it to you one more time, and then we'll do the next. So those are the ones that we went over so far. We went over the Terra Esco, Terra Esco, Ecolano, Terra Ecolano, Venetian Red, Raw Umber, Burgundy Ochre, Pompeii Red, Roasted French Ochre, English Red Earth, Yellow Ochre, and Raw Sienna. <laughs> Renee says you should have your team print out labels and cut them off so you can just move them around. I like that. I think sometimes my 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 team's a great team. They are just they're super fantastic. Okay, so now. up with these. Just need a second to make one, two, three, four spaces here. 
Can you believe it's almost, almost June? That's, it's amazing how fast this goes. Oh, thank you guys for being patient with me. So, you taught me a lot. So here we go. This is going to be raw umber. This is going to be burnt umber. This is going to be burnt umber. Burnt umber. So even though we're going to be going over groups, if there's colors that you really wanted to see or really wanted to see a color mixed with another color, um, I will take to the I will take those out and put them to the side, and then we can do it. Um, I'll certainly make time to do those. So don't worry about we haven't seen um, that color yet. Maybe it's a, a cobalt, etc. If you want to see even something we've already done, just let me know and, I, and I'll pull those colors out and we can play with it. Okay, this is going to be raw, raw umber, and this is a, a natural domestic. This is fired gold ochre, and fired gold ochre is burnt Verona gold pigment from Verona, Italy, and it's a natural. Oh, that's kind of cool. Okay. This one's going to be Indian red. The last one is English red ochre, which is a natural and from England. Yeah, that, that Indian red is just powerful. And it's a synthetic. So we have a natural, so the raw umber natural. We have the fired gold ochre, which is a burnt Verona natural. We have the English red ochre, which is a natural. And then we have the Indian red, which is a red iron oxide synthetic. And it's got some punch to it. Hello, Misha. Okay, so now ah, damn it, I 
Those are my favorite. So Raphael, if you, Raphael, if you can tell me the 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 company, you don't have to, you can you can just send it to to me if you want. That's fine. And what I'll do is I will pull their. We have all the colors from all the all the um, other companies, and I'll pull their information and tell you what the what our corresponding would be. Yeah, in general, if it's a if it's a single pigment, um, there's there's some again there's all, it's it's in general because as you know the some of the um, the lunars granulate are a single pigment, um, but you tend to you tend you would tend to see more of the granulation within the the naturals. But of course, it depends on how the particular pigment manufacturer um, purifies it to, to what level. You have a beautiful oil, so there we go. Okay, so that takes us through the siennas, um, the ochres. The majority of the oxides. Let me bring this back so you can kind of see what we did. Here's some of the colors that we played with. Actually, this is ours over here. I'll, I'll do that to go forward base. Thank you, Renee. This palette and the blue one are my best are my best choice. Well, that's yeah, I like that. So that's the Venetian red here. This Venetian red is a synthetic. And let me see if I can see. I wanted to show you that. That's only when you're trying to find it, so I can't find it. But I'll do that next week. I'll take out the Venetian red and the Italian Venetian, and we'll put them side by side to each other. Well, with that, making good ground going over the colors. Um, next week what I'd like to do is um, probably go through one pigment maybe from um, how it started to where it's at. So I'll pick one out and we'll see the different phases of that pigment. And we'll talk about the two societies. Um, it'll just give you more information on how, how to read the color name, color index name and the color index. Um, I won't spend a huge amount of time with it because I know some are interested and some are mildly interested. And I want to make sure that I, I give all of you something. 
Um, if you have ideas, I read over all the things that you say. Um, so go ahead and, and leave the message and I read over and I enjoy that. So if there's a color you wanna see mixed with something else, let me know what that is and I'll pull it out. I think next week we'll put this down for just a second. We have made really good grounds. We're done almost all of these down here now. Um, so we have quite a few of the, of the greens left. Um, some of the yellows. And quite a bit of the, the grays. So I'll, that's what I'll be going over next time. And then we'll do the Primatex. We'll talk about the Primatex and, and we'll go over those. So thank you all for joining me. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is now that we're starting to open up in Seattle, still, um, still practicing safety, but I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit with uh, Ron and figure out how to show you um, live the Xenon Fadometer. Um, I just need to think through how I can do that, um, but I kind of like that. So thank you everybody. I wish you health and safety. I look forward to seeing you um, next week. Please take care of yourselves and thank you for, for um, joining me. You make, a, um, you make this so enjoyable for me. So thank you so much. Bye bye everybody.